Imagine the responsibility fell to you, that you had to keep our planet's birds safe from harm. Where would you put them? Where on earth would they be safe? Maybe you would look to the far edges of the map in search of a place to hide them in parts unknown, far away from civilization, far, far out to sea, on tiny remote islands a place where even in the modern age the human hand would barely reach and whose secret would be kept from most on earth. Such a faraway place really exists, a place where mammoth undersea mountains stretch upward thousands of feet to pierce the surface. For thousands of years, these tiny islands, protected by their remoteness from humankind, have served as a place of safekeeping, where Mother Nature has quietly harbored the second largest population of seabirds in the world. The islands are barely visible on the charts, bearing the unusual names of Tristan da Cunha, Nightingale, Goff, and Inaccessible Islands. These dots of brilliant green in the middle of the vast, churning blue of the South Atlantic are the stuff that bird lovers' wildest dreams are made of. But the most beloved resident of all is the northern rockhopper penguin. 65% of the world's population lives here, feeding at sea, nesting ashore, unperturbed by the fewer than 300 people who call Tristan da Cunha home. The Tristanians call their island the world's remotest island. A signpost points east toward the nearest civilization, Cape Town, South Africa, 1,511 miles away. The Silver Sea Line's expedition ship, Prince Albert II, departed in March 2011 on what was intended as an expedition of discovery and education it ultimately became much more. The plan? Sail from Cape Horn at the tip of South America to the Cape of Good Hope at the tip of South Africa, visiting the Falkland Islands, South Georgia Island, and a little-known place called Tristan da Cunha along the way. The magic of the Falklands and South Georgia is overwhelming. The visitors delighted in their close encounters and marveled at the penguins' unique ability to emerge onto the beach from hundreds of feet below the ocean's surface, walk up to you, look you in the eye, and extend a greeting. Penguins' near-human antics have endeared them to us like few other species.
While the Prince Albert II was spending its first day at South Georgia Island, 2,000 miles to the north in the port of Santos, Brazil, a 738-foot Maltese-registered bulk carrier named Oliva, carrying a crew of 22 and a cargo of 65 metric tons of soybeans, departed for Singapore, where it planned to take on fuel before arriving at its final destination, China. Three days later, Prince Albert II began a four-day steam to Tristan da Cunha. Hours before arriving, the Prince Albert II received a radio transmission from authorities at Tristan. A cargo ship, the Oliva, had slammed into the rocks at the northwestern corner of Nightingale Island, a small, uninhabited neighboring island of Tristan da Cunha, roughly 12 miles away. The Prince Albert II was asked to assist in rescuing 10 crew members who remained stranded aboard the Oliva. Crew and passengers watched the helpless Oliva held fast against the rocks and pummeled by waves. Its captain confirmed that water had begun to flood its engine room. The huge swell and howling winds prevented a rescue attempt until several hours later when the Prince Albert II's expedition team departed in three small zodiacs. Immediately, the team reported an enormous oil slick. So it the pick up the smell is terrible here with this. It's like uh, uh, heavy fuel. We can see the huge hole on the side of the ship just now. Right above the rocks, there's a massive hole. The 300,000 gallons of heavy marine oil that the Oliva carried as its fuel was gushing into the sea. Captain Alexander Golubev warned his expedition team to keep their Zodiacs in clear water to be sure their engines don't pump oil into their cooling systems and cause them to fail. I would suggest you come away from there in between uh, just just so we don't uh, have the idling too long, so we have tough cooling. The team radioed instructions to the captain of the Oliva, and the dangerous rescue in high seas proceeded. Uh, they stay on the rope place, on the ladder, and then a boat come in, and they step right down, and off we go. After a tense and difficult operation, Captain Golubev confirmed that all 10 crew members had been transferred to the Zodiacs. Staff Captain, everybody off the vessel. Thank you very much. The crew members were then transferred to an awaiting fishing vessel from which the captain of the Oliva radioed Captain Golubev to express his gratitude. The expedition team returned to the Prince Albert II to cheers from the passengers. But as they approached, the afternoon sun revealed that their bodies and boats were dripping in oil. Everything the team wore and the Zodiacs themselves would need to be destroyed.
Less than 10 hours later, the enormous swell broke the Oliva's back. A massive oil slick surrounded Nightingale Island, and amid the foamy brown breakers crashing against Nightingale's steep walls lay living proof that it doesn't take an oil tanker or deep-sea oil well blowout to create a devastating oil spill. The fuel supply for an ordinary cargo ship carrying soybeans can be even more lethal especially if it delivers its payload to the very doorstep of a place as vulnerable as Nightingale Island. But it soon became clear that Oliva wasn't just hemorrhaging its fuel at one of the worst possible places on the planet. The oil spill was also happening at the worst possible moment in time. This was molting season, and tens of thousands of penguins were ashore. As they entered the water, they immediately became coated with oil. In the blink of an eye, the remoteness that has for centuries protected the incredible wildlife of these islands suddenly became its worst challenge. With no airport or landing strip, the nearest help was a five to seven day steam across the South Atlantic's rough seas to Cape Town. The Prince Albert II delivered a small supply of parkas, boots and gloves from its stores to help the rescuers. The community on Tristan de Cunha pulled together and dropped everything to help the penguins. They converted the community swimming pool and storage shed into rehabilitation centers and did what they could as they relocated nearly 4,000 oiled penguins to Tristan de Cunha for rehabilitation. They sent fishermen out into the treacherous seas to catch food for the hungry birds. What they couldn't catch they found in their freezers donating their personal supplies of frozen fish meant to feed their families. Groups around the world responded. Despite the dedicated efforts of so many, only 10% of the rescued penguins survived. Thousands died. To make matters worse, northern rockhoppers, despite their remote home, have declined nearly 90% since the 1950s and are classified as an endangered species. Scientists attribute climate change and overfishing to their decline. It's still too early to tell what the long-term impact of the Oliva disaster will be, but some recent surveys show a dramatic decline in the population. How was it possible that in 2011, a ship barely two years old could run headlong into the most remote island group in the world? An investigation report released by the Maltese government in 2012 reveals what happened. Oliva was in compliance with regulations even though it was not equipped with a piece of equipment that could have prevented the disaster. An electronic chart display and information system that electronically overlays the ship's position onto a nautical chart and allows the course of the ship to be plotted and monitored electronically. Instead, the Oliva crew relied on plotting course and position by hand on paper charts, and the investigation revealed that the vessel did not have the correct large-scale chart covering the Tristan Islands. Instead, they plotted their course on a chart that covered much of the South Atlantic, a dangerous practice. The second mate made an error in plotting one of the waypoints for the ship's course. While it appeared the Oliva would clear the islands by 10 nautical miles, the course, in fact, put the ship on its collision course. 
Although the bridge team was aware that they would be passing close to some islands, they were not aware as to when it would take place and potential hazards were not marked on the chart. Just after 4 a.m. on March 16th, the second mate noticed a large echo on the radar screen, but he failed to identify or investigate it as a possible landmass. Nor did the second mate tell the first mate about the echo when the first mate took over the watch 30 minutes later. The chief mate noticed the echoes but dismissed them as rain clouds. The investigation also revealed that the chief mate was not feeling well the prior evening and had taken an unknown medication. He required two wake-up calls that morning. On a typical afternoon along the New Jersey coast, we find all manner of merchant ships flying many different flags, carrying bulk cargo, containers, chemicals, and automobiles. At the very same instant in time, we find thousands of such ships in our rivers and bays, along our coasts, and on the high seas, tracing routes around the world along every continent. But this is just a single snapshot in time. When we consider the trips of those ships over weeks and months, the resulting picture is sobering. Growing international commerce has created trade routes that increasingly crisscross the world. And now, melting ice in the Arctic is opening access to new trade routes in previously inaccessible waters. Since 1970, the amount of material shipped by sea has more than tripled. Over the last decade, nearly 25,000 large tankers, bulk carriers, and container ships roamed the seas each year, along with more than 18,000 smaller cargo vessels. Recent statistics show accident rates on the rise. In 2000, a bulk carrier, the Treasure, with a load of iron ore, sank near Cape Town, South Africa, releasing more than 400,000 gallons of heavy marine oil directly into the waters around the major breeding colonies for the African penguin, affecting more than 40% of the world population. Sandcob mounted what is still considered the largest animal rescue in history rehabilitating more than 40,000 birds. In 2011, just seven months after the Oliva disaster, the container ship Rena ran aground on New Zealand's Astrolabe Reef and later split in half, releasing thousands of gallons of heavy marine oil, killing thousands of seabirds, including the little penguin. Fortunately, teams were able to rescue and rehabilitate many of these tiny penguins. Most people immediately know the largest maritime oil spill in Alaskan history, the Exxon Valdez. But few would know the second largest, the Selendang IU, in 2004, while en route from Seattle to China, the Malaysian ship's engine failed during a fierce Bering Sea storm. Helplessly adrift, it grounded off the Aleutian Islands and broke in half. Six crewmen were lost. The ship spilled its cargo and more than 335,000 gallons of heavy oil into the Alaskan Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, 
killing thousands of seabirds. Like the Oliva, the Selendang IU was also carrying soybeans. In February 2013, Australian television reported a strange discovery on a beach along its southeastern shore. A lifeboat has washed up on South Australia's south coast two years after its cargo ship was grounded in the South Atlantic Ocean. This is the site that greeted Nick Barmer when he was fishing at Salt Creek, 150 kilometres southeast of Adelaide last weekend. The seven metre long lifeboat had made an 8,000 kilometre journey before washing up at a beach near the Coorong. We did some investigation and found that it was from a, uh, a wrecked uh, vessel, soybean bulk carrier, going from Brazil to China. That ship, the Greek-owned MS Oliver, ran aground near the Nightingale Islands in the South Atlantic Ocean in March 2011. This life raft actually must have broken loose and has drifted on ocean currents, um, probably the South Atlantic and the Southern Indian currents, all the way to Australia. The discovery of Oliva's lifeboat nearly two years after it sunk is perhaps a fitting symbol of such a disaster, a haunting echo that reminds us that the impact of such a tragedy can persist years after the spectacle has passed and the headlines have long forgotten it, with ripples that can extend around the world. Where would you put them? Where on earth would they be safe? This is a story of something that shouldn't have happened. Some would say it couldn't have happened. But it's becoming apparent that such statistically impossible events aren't as impossible as we once thought. The Oliva is a lesson that even at those distant margins of the map, safety is no guarantee. It means that the people who live in these impossibly remote places, the caretakers of so much of Earth's wildlife, have a daunting responsibility, one we can't ask them to face alone. This story has a sad ending only if we allow it. Already the disaster at Nightingale has united people around the world trying to make a difference. It has strengthened our love of what's still wild and untamed out there and our unwavering resolve to protect it. And it has reminded us how important it is to care about the animals we may never see ourselves, the people we may never meet, and even those distant, tiny islands we may never visit. <laughs>